In this video, we're going to derive a few equations to do with simple harmonic motion. The first one we'll uh, look at is which you might have all seen before. X is a displacement which is equal to the amplitude of the oscillation times by cosine of omega t where omega is the angular frequency. From this starting point, we're going to derive the fact that a, the mass on the spring or a pendulum or whatever system you're considering, is equal to minus omega squared of the displacement. The third equation we're going to look at is V equals omega square root of A squared minus X squared. Again, where A is the amplitude of the oscillation, X is the displacement of the oscillation, V is the velocity at a point, and then omega is the angular frequency. From this equation, we can find a fourth equation for the maximum velocity. V max, which is equal to omega a, where omega and a mean the same thing as they did before. In this video, I'm going to talk a lot about the quantity omega. It's very simple if you haven't seen it before. It's 2 pi times by the frequency of a simple harmonic oscillator. It also is equal to 2 pi over t, the time period. So if you know the frequency or the time period, you can work out omega. Omega is the angular frequency or the angular velocity, and it's measured in radians per second. So if we consider a pendulum and we think about three points in its motion, we have its leftmost point, when it's at the middle, and its rightmost point. If we define the leftmost point as the negative direction, and the rightmost point as the positive direction. And if we consider that this is the maximum left point and this is the maximum right point, and then we start it oscillating from the maximum right point, we can draw a displacement time graph for that motion. So the first point here is going to be high, and we can call that A for the amplitude. Eventually, it's got to get to the other side, to the left, which is the most negative point. Because of conservation of energy, it's going to reach the same distance of the other side, so we know that it will eventually reach minus A. To do this, it has to cross the origin at some point, and this is the same as the zero displacement here. So we can put that in as well, and we can put the negative A point in afterwards. So we know the motion is going to look something like that because it's going to be sinusoidal. Once it gets to the leftmost point, it's going to swing back the other way and go back up to A. So that's something like that. That's the displacement curve for this pendulum. If we write this equation out, we get x equals A cosine omega t, where A is the amplitude, as we've already discussed, and omega is the angular frequency. So that's our displacement time graph. If we look at the gradient of the displacement time graph, we'll be able to get the velocity time graph. So the gradient at the very top, it's flat on a cosine curve. So we know that we can call the gradient at time equals zero as zero. The gradient slowly gets more negative until it crosses the axis, at which point it's at its most negative. Then the gradient begins rounding out again and becomes less negative until it gets to the minimum point on the cosine graph, which corresponds to this graph reaching zero again, since the gradient is zero. Then the gradient starts to get positive again, until it again reaches a maximum when this graph crosses the axis. And then the gradient rounds out again and becomes less positive, until it again reaches zero, like that. So this point and this point correspond, this point and this point correspond, and this point and this point correspond, and this point and this point correspond. They recognize is a sine curve, except it's upside down, it's negative. So we can call this, we know that it's at least proportional to negative sine omega t. So we know that the velocity at any point is proportional to minus sine omega t. We don't know what the coefficient is yet, but we'll find that out later. Using the same procedure we just did, we can work out the acceleration time graph. Again, we look at the gradient at each point of the velocity time graph, and that gives us our acceleration time graph. So the gradient at zero is the most negative it can be. So that starts off here. Once it gets to the minimum on the sine curve on the velocity time graph, the gradient zero, 
So we know we go up to a zero value on the acceleration time graph. Then the gradient begins to get positive and reaches a maximum positive gradient when it crosses the axis. Then the gradient gets less positive and is zero at the peak of the sine curve here. And then the gradient gets negative until it reaches, a, again, a maximum negative as it crosses the axis. So now we have a displacement time graph a velocity time graph and an acceleration time graph. You will notice that the acceleration time graph is the same as the cosine graph except it's flipped, just like how this is a flipped sine curve. So again, we can deduce that the acceleration must be proportional to minus cosine omega t. Again, well, we don't know the coefficient, but we will find it. We reach these velocity and acceleration time graphs along with our proportionality statements by looking at them graphically and analyzing it. There's another way to do it, and that's with differentiation. If you haven't differentiated sine curves and cosine curves before, don't worry, you can look it up. Um, but you should also know, if y is equal to cosine x, then dy dx is equal to minus sine x. If y is equal to sine x, then dy dx is equal to cosine x. If y is equal to cosine 3x, for example, then dy dx is equal to minus sine x again, except we have three times in front, so it's minus three sine three x. Using this information, we can work out the same proportionality statements we had before, except we can actually find the proportionality constants. So we know from before that x is equal to a cos omega t. The gradient of the displacement time graph is a velocity, and to differentiate essentially means to take the gradient. If we differentiate x with respect to t, we're taking the gradient of a displacement time graph, which is the velocity. So if we differentiate x with respect to t, and if x is a cosine omega t, and we use the rule we just learnt for differentiating cosine and sine functions, we know that the answer to this is minus a omega sine omega t. We also know, taking the derivative of v with respect to t, will give us the acceleration, since the gradient of a velocity time graph is just the acceleration. We know from our rules that we just discussed that taking the derivative of sine x gives us just cosine x, no negatives, so we keep the negative sign, we keep the amplitude, we keep the omega, but we get another omega from the rule we just discussed about the fact that if you differentiate a sine function or a cosine function with a number next to the variable, that number comes out. So we get omega squared cosine omega t, which is exactly what we got from the same graphical consideration. So now we get to our first proper equation that we've derived. If a is equal to minus a omega squared cosine omega t, we can freely swap around a and omega, that's fine. So we can say that a is actually equal to minus omega squared a cosine omega t. But we also know that a cosine omega t is what we earlier defined to be displacement x. So we can sub in a cos omega t for x. And then we end up with a equals minus omega squared x. And this makes sense because we know that a is proportional to minus x. And now we actually know that the proportionality constant is uh, minus omega squared. So if you know the frequency and you know the displacement at any point, you know the acceleration too. And that's the definition of SHM. Now we're going to look at the velocity. The same thing as before. We don't actually have to redo our calculation because we already have it. We know that v is equal to minus a omega sine omega t. So we'll start with that. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to square both sides. And when we square, we lose the minus sign because two negative numbers all times together to give us a positive one. Now I'm going to take over the omega squared and the a squared. Now we're going to use an identity. The identity is cosine squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1. Obviously, x could be anything. In this case, it's omega t. So we're going to substitute our sine squared omega t for 1 minus cosine squared omega t. So we end up with v squared over omega squared a squared is equal to 1 minus cosine squared omega t. Now if we bring the a squared back across, we end up with a squared minus a squared cosine squared omega t is equal to v squared over omega squared. 
And if we square the entire thing rather than the individual parts, we can see again that a cosine omega t is just x. So we end up with v squared over omega squared is equal to a squared minus x squared, because it's x in the bracket squared. Then, if we take the square root of both sides, we get that. And then we times both sides by omega. And we end up with our equation for v. The final equation we're going to work out is a simple addition to this one. If we want to know the maximum velocity, there's a few ways we can think about it. The first one is we consider our pendulum again. If we consider our pendulum again, the pendulum is going to be very slow when it's at the maximums of its motion, and it's going to be the quickest when it's going through the origin. So if we apply that to our equation that we have here, we can say that the velocity is going to be a maximum when the pendulum bob is at the origin, or in other words, when the displacement is zero. So then we have v maximum is equal to omega square root a squared minus the displacement is zero, which simplifies to omega and then a squared square rooted, which is just a, and that's our final equation. The other way you could think about this is you could draw a graph of v, or you could think about the fact that because this is a negative of a squared quantity, it's always going to take away. So in order to get the highest value for v, we need x to be zero. I hope that helps you understand where these equations come from. They're not just plucked out of thin air and they describe simple harmonic motion.